So you probably don't need a reminder of what the different parts of the heart are and what they do, but let's draw a very simplified diagram. Of course, it's not actually blue, but that's to show that it's deoxygenated blood that comes in. We have the atrium, that's the right atrium. So we're looking at a person's heart, as it were, from the front. Then it goes into the right ventricle. Then it goes out to the lungs via the pulmonary artery. It comes back into the left atrium, then into the left ventricle, and then out to the rest of the body. So we call it a double pump, as it were, because blood goes through the heart twice for every time it goes around the body. First to the lungs, then to the body and back. And of course we have valves here as well, don't we, to stop backflow. But have you ever thought what actually makes the heart contract in order for it to pump blood out? Well, about here, we have a group of amazing cells. Well, it should be in the walls of the right atrium there. So group of cells in right atrium's wall produce an electrical signal, and then that makes both atria contract. So if both atria contract, that means that blood goes from the right atrium into the right ventricle, from the left atrium into the left ventricle. Here's a clever bit. Between the atrium and the ventricle, there's another group of cells called the atrioventricular node. Now, obviously, we don't want all of the heart to contract in one go because that would mean that blood would not be able to go from the atria to the ventricles because the ventricle would be pushing back as well. The atrioventricular node produces, and we can call that the AV node, that produces an, about a 0.1 second delay. So it delays the signal from going to the ventricles. So the signal is then passed to the ventricles and they contract. That is mind-blowingly clever stuff. If you want to know your pulse, then you can just put your fingers on your wrist or on your neck next to your jugular, and you can feel how many times your heart is beating a second. But you can't tell a lot from that. You can't see if there's one thing wrong in this whole process here. And that's why we have something called an ECG, an electrocardiogram. Electro is to do with electricity, because we know that that is involved. Cardio is to do with the heart. So what we do is attach electrodes on the chest because that's where signal is strongest. If you put it on your legs, then the signal isn't going to reach down there very well. And these measure PD. Now the signal isn't massive to begin with, and because your body isn't amazingly conductive, that means that by the time you get to your chest, the signal is fairly weak. So we need to amplify the signal, and that's with a high impedance amplifier. The skin is smoothed, and you can remove hairs to make it better so you have better contact. And you can actually use a gel as well to make sure that the signal is conducted as well as possible from your skin to the electrodes. Now, because an electrocardiograph, that's the piece of equipment that does it, because it's very sensitive, it can actually pick up very faint signals from elsewhere as well. So you should perform it away from sources of EM effectively. If you do an electrocardiogram in a room that's got lots of wires, just in the walls, you'll actually pick up a 50 hertz trace from the mains. We know that if electrons are flowing through a wire, then they produce a magnetic field. And so that can actually induce across these electrodes as well. And we don't want that. So what we do is record what the PD is across the electrodes and plot that against time. And we should end up with this characteristic trace. I'm sure you've seen that in hospitals or in hospitals on movies anyway. We hear that characteristic beep, beep, beep every time you see that you see one of these traces. It's not just one spike. So we give these very specific letters, P, Q, R, S, and T. And the good thing about these is that they all happen at fairly regular intervals. So let's say that P happens at 0 0.2 seconds, R, that big spike, happens at 0 0.4, just before you get to T, it's about 0 0.6 seconds and just after that's about 0 0.8. Again, it's not going to be the same for everybody. It depends on your heart rate, your BPM. But for about 60 to 70 BPM, this is how often they happen. So these are all the different electrical signals that make the heart contract. So what do we say comes first? Well, we said that it is the signal to make the atria contract. And it makes sense that it's not a big signal because it doesn't need to be a big contraction in order to get blood just from the atria into the ventricles. We call that the P wave, not to be confused with seismic P waves. QRS wave, we said that a short delay after, that's the signal that's gone through the 
atrioventricular node, and that's a signal to make ventricles contract. And like we said, that needs to be a lot bigger in order to pump blood to the lungs and to the rest of the body as well. And there's actually one more as well. The T wave is actually a signal that tells the ventricles to relax, ready for the whole thing to start again so blood can go from the atria into the ventricles again. So if you have an electrocardiogram like this, you can see if the heart is working fairly healthily, and this heart seems like it is. Now the most common thing that you'll see that might be wrong with your heart and this ECG is with the QRS wave. Let's say that the spikes aren't that prominent, that they're t a little bit too low. That means that the ventricles aren't contracting as much as they should do in order to pump blood around your body and to your lungs effectively. And that could be due to the signal not being transmitted from the atria through the atrioventricular node to the ventricles well enough. So in that case, you might need a pacemaker which creates a signal in order to do the job instead. I hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you have any comments or questions, put them down below. I'll see you next time.